So I'm very, very pleased to have Simon Upton, uh, who is going to be uh, uh, talking to us next. Um, S Simon, um, Simon is the uh, uh, S Simon's in charge of the um, uh, OECD's um, Environment Directorate, and uh, the Environment Directorate is essentially responsible for um, monitoring the environmental performance of OECD countries. Um, analyzing the uh, economic impact of them uh, and generally uh, putting in place or, or supporting the interventions that hopefully will make a difference in uh, reshaping behavior. Um, he was previously Minister of Environment uh, and Science and Technology in New Zealand and um, also chaired the UN Commission on Sustainable Development in 1999. So Simon, thank you very much. Well, thank you. The, uh, this conference was originally going to be opened by a minister, but he couldn't come. So I'm the off-course substitute, and you have a former minister, and I can assure you there's nothing more former than a former uh, minister. Um, you might ask, I think actually you, you gave us the clue, you might ask why you'd invite a politician to an address a business uh, conference, and I think the answer is that what governments do or don't do is likely to be decisive. They can either provide a long-term, uh, stable framework for action by others, uh, or they can be a source of complete distraction. Um, and we hope, post the Paris Agreement, that it's going to be the former, providing a long-term direction which people can invest in and buy into. Uh, we hope it's going to be that because there's already plenty of uncertainty out there. I mean, the fossil fuel sector at this moment is in complete turmoil. Uh, we've seen oil prices uh, collapse and with them $400 billion worth of upstream investment suspended. Uh, we've seen coal prices collapse too. China wants less of the stuff. Regulators want fewer emissions from burning the stuff. And governments everywhere have given a lot of support to uh, renewables uh, when it comes to power generation, which has seen those costs uh, plummet. So uh, we've got everyone navel-gazing now around whether this is cyclical or is it structural. When will things return to normal? Well, governments, at least when they have their climate change hats on, say that there shouldn't be a return to normal. They want the world's energy supply to change out of recognition. That's because they've looked at Martin's charts. By the way, I had a brother called Martin. He spent his life being called Simon. It drove him absolutely crazy. I'm quite used to it. <laughs> but they've looked at Martin's charts. They've looked at the IPC's charts, and they said, we don't want that. And so we want energy supply to change out of recognition. Uh, and we want many consumer behaviours that we're all used to to change out of recognition as well. And of course, that's what's implied by the Paris Agreement, which talks about trying to aim for a two-degree world and even flirting with a 1.5-degree world. Such a world, in terms of energy supply, won't look like the world we live in today. Governments are effectively insisting that they want to steadily eliminate fossil fuel emissions. Well, looking at the corpses and the wounded on the fossil fuel battlefield, a visitor from Mars might conclude that this was indeed a foretaste of things to come with the transition to low carbon. And not such a bad outcome either if the aim is genuinely to shift capital away from the old fossil energy economy to one which is more compatible with planetary limits. Yet, there are plenty of people out there, especially fossil fuel producers, who are determined to push the new fossil economy far into the future. Now, if it's going to happen, it's a long way away. For example, BP, in its energy outlook, confidently states that fossil fuels will provide around 60% of the additional energy and account for almost 80% of total energy supply in 2035. That's running towards the end of the carbon budget period. 
Not so long ago, Chevron cast doubt on the effectiveness, that was the word used, the effectiveness of carbon pricing as a strategy uh, on the premise that customers want affordable energy. The world's going to need all forms of energy, asserted their chief executive, John Watson, outlining his expectation that the company will remain a vibrant and viable business for a long time. I listened to Tony Haywood, the chairman of Glencore, at the Paris Business Summit in May, this time last year. It's a slightly more sophisticated message. He thought that carbon pricing had a, a role to play. This was, this was fine. But, he said, let's be realistic. There's a lot of fossil fuel out there, and it's going to be burnt. So, for the fossil fuel incumbents, the new normal seems to look a lot like the old one. The message I get as I read these statements, and there's varying degrees of sophistication, is hold your hats if you can. There will be many more holes drilled and mines dug before the curtain goes down on this act. Never mind Martin's carbon budget and the trillion tons. It's going to happen. Well, depressingly, they may still be proved right because, sure, global coal demand might conceivably have peaked with the transformation of the Chinese economy, despite, uh, I note, a rush of new build approvals last year following decentralization of the process. But oil and gas investment is an order of magnitude bigger. Last year's oil demand growth, last year's oil demand growth, and we're not exactly living in the middle of the strongest uh, economic uh, times, but last year's oil demand growth was still three times that which would be consistent with a two-degree path. It would take, my colleagues at the IEA tell me, around 50 million electric cars to offset the additional emissions. And, of course, fossil fuel technologies don't stand still. This is a very technologically sophisticated and agile sector. When the productivity gains in a new sector like shale gas in the States have been truly impressive. So unless there's a sustained message from governments that the end of the fossil age is in sight, investment in the sector could just as easily recover, and the price lows of 2015 might be remembered as part of just another boom and bust cycle. I think the jury's out. Well, faced with so much uncertainty and the path dependency that follows in the wake of long-lived investments, and that's really important because while people are debating the future, thinking about where it might go or mightn't go, investments are being laid down and they tend to have a long life and they carry a carbon shadow with them if they're investments in long-lived fossil infrastructure. Once they're there, of course, those who own them lobby to keep them going because they invested in them. So, how in that sort of world should governments respond? How can they make long-term policies that send clear messages when there is still so much uncertainty? The truth is that government actions have never fully lined up with the aspirations they have expressed on climate change. The Paris Agreement may have been historic, but national pledges, the INDCs as they're called, which were made before Paris, fall far below the ambition of the two degree upper threshold called for, let alone the more ambitious 1.5 degree threshold. Let me recall the roller coaster of the last decade. Not long ago, the expectation was that high and volatile commodity prices would provide, with increasing energy demand, a natural mounting incentive to increase efficiency and go after clean, non-fossil technologies. As long as 2012, sorry, as recently as 2012, the IEA, our sister organization, was saying that, and I quote them, in the longer term, Improvements in extraction and conversion technologies are unlikely to offset the increasing demand, resulting in a continued rise in fossil fuel prices. Only 2012. 
Even if government imposed carbon prices or taxes were mollusk, or even non-existent, consumers would eventually be driven by high market prices to change their behaviour. So the challenge was on the production side. And given the returns for the foreseeable future, what was going to stop hungry capital seeking out new resource frontiers? And we saw it. Shale, deep water, the Arctic, you name it. No part of the planet was too expensive to probe. And of course, in the immediate wake of the global financial crisis, many governments were hoping that revenue from new sources of oil and gas could plug their budget deficits. I just watched the newspapers post-2008 and looked to see what was happening in terms of new exploration. And I noted warm welcomes for oil and gas exploration in countries as different as Greece, Ireland, New Zealand, Spain, and Italy, and plenty of others. Now, of course, the tables have turned. Commodity prices have collapsed, and with them, the high returns that sucked in capital investment. Producers don't need governments to tell them to stop investing when the returns have evaporated. So the challenge now switches to the consumer side of the equation. What measures can be taken to shift consumption patterns with fuel prices falling? Again, governments find themselves conflicted. They're desperate to prime flagging economies. Many are hoping cheaper energy will help to reboot domestic demand and provide a boost for industries like air transport and tourism more generally. I'm sure you've all read the articles about North Americans and how far they think they'll travel. You can get the big car out, buy the bigger one, and take a longer holiday. Some governments, even, like here in the United Kingdom, are even introducing new tax concessions to prop up flagging oil and gas production. Now, conventional wisdom would have it that in the ordinary course of events, cheaper energy will support demand and help to get consumers and producers back into a mutually reinforcing symbiosis. This would support growth overall, although with gains to oil consumers largely at the cost of producers. The signals to date have been mixed, but there's some evidence that oil importing economies have been helped. As The Economist recently noted, the world is both a producer and a consumer. What producers lose and consumers gain from a drop in prices sums to zero. Conventionally, extra spending by oil importers exceeds cuts in spending by exporters, boosting global aggregate demand. This is a very technical debate. I have cross-examined my colleagues at the OECD. They would broadly support that. But, of course... Governments have, in their Paris Agreement, effectively said there won't be an ordinary course of events, neither for the short term nor the long term. They've explicitly agreed that, and I quote them, in order to achieve the long-term temperature goal set out in Article 2, parties aim to reach global peaking of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible and to undertake rapid reductions thereafter so as to achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases in the second half of the century. Rather a lot of words there. It's typical diplomatic language. But what it says is that countries decided to address the reality that their climate goal implies zero net emissions. Now, if the language is elliptical, the meaning is not. And net zero is a long way from anything normal. So in the same way where Martin says we're at levels that we've never seen in anything remotely like times we are used to dealing with, well, the same can be said about the net zero target. It's not remotely related to anything we've experienced since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So what should governments do now? Well, countries come in different shapes and sizes with very different interests, notwithstanding their agreement that a dangerously warmer planet is in no one's interests. But the formula depends on where you stand. And I'm going to give you four standpoints depending on what sort of country you might be. First, 
if you are the government of an oil producing developing country, you should consider whether the resource you own has an economic future given the amount of atmospheric space left for emissions. Now in countries like Saudi Arabia, Iraq and Iran, where oil is plentiful and cheap to extract, there is certainly business left to do. Even on a radical decarbonisation pathway, the world will consume sufficient oil for those resources to be produced. Iraq's ever-increasing production, despite the havoc wrought by ISIS, is a remarkable reminder of the region's resilience. Indeed, the country's output increased more than the Saudis did over the past few years. Saudi Arabia's decision to break up the cartel has certainly had a dampening effect on competing supply from expensive places, as suggested by the 400 billion of arrested investment I mentioned. Saudi Arabia's oil minister has made it clear that his country is no longer prepared to sacrifice market share to prop up more costly producers, even at considerable short-term cost to its economy. However, with lower demand on a two-degree pathway making high-cost oil developments unnecessary, lower prices will cut into the rents that are critical to finance budgets across the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is reducing public spending to compensate for a public deficit that last year ballooned to 15% of GDP. Policymakers in oil producing countries should use the breathing space provided by their sovereign wealth funds to create the institutional foundations of sustainable growth outside the fossil fuel sector. Other countries in this group with less generous endowments will need to get economic reform and subsidy removal underway even faster. This is happening. Russia announced an additional 10% cut to public spending following the uh, collapse in prices. Uh, Indonesia was set to save almost $14 billion in 2015 alone after scrapping gasoline subsidies in the 2015 budget and capping diesel fuel subsidies. So reality is coming home to roost for those who've been relying on this mana. Second group of countries, if you're the government of a developed, <coughs> developed oil producing country, you should, if you haven't already done so, think hard about banking the remaining rents so that there is some capital substitution going on to permit life after oil. That's what Norway has done to such significant national advantage over the last 25 years. Third group of countries. If you're the government of an oil import dependent developed state, like my one, the chances are that you're already a pretty efficient user of fossil fuel, so your economy doesn't need an infusion of cheap energy to underwrite its future. Your economy survived $100 plus per barrel of oil, so it's actually quite a good time to introduce carbon taxes so that the windfall of cheap oil prices isn't simply gobbled up at the gas station. You should furthermore shelve any delusions about hoping to find black gold, enjoy the short-run benefits of cheaper oil and start planning now to ensure that all infrastructural investments and your regulatory environment is tuned to changing technology. And finally, and this is at the global level the most sensitive group of countries, finally, if you're the government of an import dependent developing state, you probably have an urgent need for energy and the widest array of possibilities to meet that need in history. You will most likely be looking to the global community for support in accessing what's called affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all in the seventh sustainable development goal. In calling for that support, you will need to take a hard look at whether the energy solutions being promoted to you are in fact either modern or sustainable. As a starting point, the burden of proof needs to be reversed so that fossil-based solutions, particularly coal, have to prove that they are competitive only if other options are not competitive after accounting for the full environmental, health and social costs of fossil combustion. 
There is nothing cheap about coal when you take into account the costs associated with its combustion. Uh, the premature mortality globally linked to this combustion is non-trivial. We've put numbers on it, uh, and it runs into the trillions. These decisions are, of course, of global significance in these countries, given the scale of current and projected emissions from them and their urgent need to provide energy to their people. There is never a right time to take climate action. I think if there's one line you recall that I say at the end of this day, it's this one. There is never a right time to take climate action. When growth is strong, there are plenty of people urging governments not to get in the way. When growth is weak, another chorus asks incredulously how climate policy advocates could possibly consider making things worse. Is there ever a Goldilocks moment for climate policy? My answer is no. It's a long-run problem that requires policies which send long-run signals. By definition, they can't be ones that are constantly being fine-tuned to the volatility of the moment. And attempting to do so risks making volatility worse. And volatility, we know, really is bad for economic growth. When I started working on this address two months ago, the oil price was barely $30 a barrel. Today, it's hovering a bit over $40. Who knows where it will be in two months, let alone two years. The climate outcome governments want is one that is utterly transformational, not incremental. Getting there is unlikely to be a smooth, stepwise process. The one problem I have with all of these graphs that you brought up is they're always, they're always smooth. <laughs> That's not, and, in, and in the physical world, there are some, there's some grounds for that, but of course then you get non-linear changes and they stop being smooth. But in the human world, they're never smooth. Technological changes wreak gales of destruction. They may well be creative, as Schumpeter put it, by giving rise to completely new technologies and business opportunities, but if you're situated on the destructive side of the equation, that's small comfort. That there will be winners as well as losers is backed up by recent research we've undertaken. Now, governments can't ignore adjustment costs, but neither can they avoid them. If they try to protect the status quo, they will only fail the climate issue, but they will not only fail the climate issue, but they will ultimately impose even higher social costs and fail to capitalize on the economic opportunities that reform can bring. And I suspect that's going to be a theme of today's conversation. This goes to the heart of a long OECD history of supporting reforms in product and labor markets to facilitate adjustment to benefit productivity growth and competitiveness. So, government policies designed to bring about that change have to be steady and consistent. The market will throw up quite enough surprises and train wrecks as it is. Some of those will call for government action, but it must be action that lubricates the change rather than tries to stop it in its tracks, like proactive new market arrangements in the electricity sector, to help integrate renewable generation, secure flexibility and reflect system costs. Once investment capital figures out that the game is over for a fossil-based economy, governments have to let the effects of the capital reallocation that follows play out. There will be plenty of human and social adjustment issues for governments to busy themselves with. But trying to fine-tune an economic and technological adjustment path will prove to be as futile as trying to control commodity prices. I hope that's of interest. And just can I say, because we're in the United Kingdom, this country almost uniquely has at the bottom of its policies the long-term vision I'm talking about. It's the one country that got a bipartisan agreement on a long-term target and a process through Parliament to follow through. That really is unique internationally. It's very good, and I just hope the UK hangs in with it. I, I, since Simon actually has to go later on, I, I just wonder whether there's one or two questions for him before we 
move on. So. Question? Question over here. Yeah. I'll ask a question to Simon. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think the key question, um, I know OECD has been working a lot on the question of the removal of subsidies, the famous half a trillion, or sometimes people quote 1.9 trillion. Just uh, a, a bit of a feeling in the context of, of what you've said, how, how do you see things? Because that's obviously one of the key litmus tests of what's happening or not happening. Well, as I mentioned, some of the, the countries which have had big consumer subsidies are getting rid of them. And you've seen that uh, in Indonesia. Just look, can I just give you the numbers on this? Because there is a lot of uh, confusion, there really is. I mean, we take a very conservative, very narrow view of what a subsidy is. You, our, our estimate is that there's 50 to 100 billion, roughly, of subsidies for both production and consumption in developed countries, okay? And look, the production ones are just as, as important. We're the only organization that measures production subsidies. The IEA me measures consumption subsidies in non-developed countries, and it uses a different technique. It's a price gap method, per perfectly respectable, been going for 25 years. But, but that, half a, that, that half a trillion, the 500 billion, that, that relates to subsidies to consumers. And of course, they're rampant in places like you know, Saudi Arabia, for instance. Uh, and then the other number you mentioned, getting to the trillions, that's an IMF number. And that, I have to say, we, we really part company there because what they're doing is they're saying, well, if there was a price on carbon uh, of this, um, you know, you know th th that's, that's the, the social cost of carbon should be this, and it's not there. So it's a subsidy not to impose that tax globally. And suddenly, the number jumps into trillions. Yeah, I, I don't think it's helpful because what we want to do is get governments to remove subsidies and those are actually in their budget, their budget lines and we can go through them and do that. It is happening. It is happening. There's a, there's a coalition of countries trying to promote this. The G20 has got uh, peer reviews going on, uh, voluntary reviews where countries say, come and, come and look at my subsidies and, and they've used a nice, it's a euphemism, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Okay? So uh, come and see if any of my subsidies are inefficient. Well, it's a good way of building confidence. The fact is, it's becoming increasingly clear. Um, it will be useful. But to be honest with you, I don't think the scale of those subsidies is so big that it's going to be uh, crucially uh, decisive. There are plenty of other things we need to do as well. Okay. W one more, then we must, yep. must move on. Yes. Uh, Ralph. Ralph Martin from Imperial College. You mentioned various uh, things governments have to do and different governments have to do. I was wondering if you think there's not also an important role for government to promote more innovation and R&D. And uh, people have talked about a, a global Apollo project or something like that. Uh, because, I mean, if you look at the figures, uh, the, the subsidies for R&D in this area are uh, ridiculously low by both by you know comparison to other things and historical standards uh, historical comparisons so I wonder if you think there's some kind of scope for that to do something together at the global level of individual governments and what that could be I don't think you're ever going to hear anyone say that we shouldn't be doing more in R&D and as you say the uh, energy R&D has been uh, uh, actually something which has declined over the last 10 or 15 years, in fact, since the first, first oil shocks. Uh, we have a whole team of people working on these issues at the OECD. It's one thing to say that R&D is a good thing. It's another thing to know how to do it. Um, and, and there's a lot of evidence that the breakthrough technologies uh, come orthogonally <laughs> from areas that you weren't consciously investing in. My feeling is that the most important thing we can do is to remove the roadblocks to the penetration of new technologies which are put there by the regulatory wiring of our economies that was designed for a fossil age. I mean, I mentioned the wholesale electricity markets, for instance. I mean, they, they weren't designed for a world of, dis, dis, um, of uh, intermittent supply across huge areas. Uh, they were designed for large central power stations on baseload and then peaking plants. So if you've got a regulatory design designed for the old world, don't expect new technologies to penetrate. And I think it's those 
sort of issues. It's, it's what business models are needed to support new technologies. That's actually probably more important than the R&D. I, I think there's huge innovation out there, both in big companies, small companies, and universities. Uh, yeah, governments have an important role to play, but that's not where the roadblocks are. The roadblocks are self-imposed restrictions on the way we run our societies. And it's not, it's not a plot. They, they weren't regulated so that the world would stay fossil. It's just that we didn't know there was a problem. So we designed our societies to run in a particular way. Now we have to change. And so it's being able to lubricate change and remove the regulations which stand in the way. And, of course, put new regulations there. I mean, we're not talking about sudden, some sort of free market nirvana where there's no regulation at all. It's a question of updating the fleet of regulatory interventions we have which make our societies work. Okay. Thank you very much, Simon.